Hey everyone, Nathan here, Absurd Being. Okay, so we're into phenomenology of perceptions. Well, still into it. Um, but we're into the final part, part three, being for itself and being in the world. Um, and so this is, there are three parts to this final part. <laughs> three chapters to this final part. This first one is the Kugito. And um, it'll probably run into three videos, this I'll break this um, this first section up into three videos. Okay, so let's get into the first part. Uh, we're talking about Descartes and the eternal cogito. So first up, um, discussing Descartes' idea here. Um, Descartes' cogito ergo sum, obviously. Um, the first thing Milo Ponti says is that if the transcendent remains transcendent, so if we keep the transcendent, um, we keep this kind of barrier between us and everything else, then we end up with Descartes' isolated thinking, self-reflective consciousness. Um, and then that's, that's Milo Ponti's co constituting consciousness. And that means that all of our knowledge of objects is drawn from ourselves. We're this isolated, insulated um, consciousness, and there's not, there's no way we can get out to anything out there. Everything is kind of locked up within ourselves. It's very inward focused, and it's the only way it can be. So such a consciousness couldn't be affected by anything. There'd be no, um, you couldn't have any kind of uh, serious or, or even real interaction with anything else because everything is purely transcendent <clears throat> and and you are constituting everything for yourself so he says it would be causa sui this one this consciousness so that means that either then if we if we adopt this this model either the kagito is simply the name for a sum of psychological events in which case my existence is never certain because it's no more immediate than any other thing. <clears throat> and this is basically the modern position, right? The modern scientific materialist position. The self, the kagito, consciousness, it's just a whole series of psychological events. That's, that's Hume too, right? Hume, or if you look inside, all you see are these events, these feelings, these... Um, thoughts you don't see anything tangible anything anything um, permanent or anything underlying any of these things um, and that means like I like Milo Ponti says my existence is never certain because it's no more immediate than anything else in the same way that all I have or the only evidence I have for anything outside me <clears throat> are individual a sum of individual sensory impressions which I then add together. That's all the, the cogito is as well. It just appears as the sum of events. Um, no more immediate than anything else. Basically, there is no self here. There is nothing that we can we can grab hold of and call a self, call a cogito. It's just, like he says, the sum of psychological events. So that's, that's the first option. It's either that or... The Kagito is beneath these events, in which case we, we have this constituting consciousness. So it's free from the limitations. It's free from all limitations. It's even free from time because un lying underneath all of these, um, these psychological events, it's it constitutes everything, not just, it doesn't just create its own perceptions. It doesn't just create value for itself, but it, 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 it's the source of everything, including time, temporality, which means that, Ponti says, it's eternal as well. Not as in living forever, but as in having the power to embrace and to anticipate temporal developments within a single intention. So basically not subject to time. It's the, the source of time. It's the origin of temporality. So those are the two options if you take Descartes' 
root, if you follow this, this idea where the transcendent remains transcendent, um, we end up with either a cogito that is nothing more than a sum of events, or this constituting consciousness, which is kind of super powerful uh, and eternal. And so the consequences then of having an, an eternal cogito like this, which is obviously what Descartes was thinking of. He wasn't thinking it's just a sum of psychological events. Like I said, that's kind of the modern position. We think, um, so you get people saying, jumping on the kind of Buddhist bandwagon, there is no self. Um, that's kind of a, a fairly typical refrain you hear from our intellectual elites these days. Um, but that was, that's not what Descartes, where Descartes was going. He went with the second option. Uh, but some of the consequences of having an eternal cogito like this, then there's no sense of receptivity or of being affected by anything, which is what, what I said at the beginning of this video too. There's, uh, and that, that obviously already doesn't ring true for human experience. We do have this sense of being affected, of being involved and affectable um, with other things. So already it's not, it's, it seems starting to seem a little bit unlikely. Um, and not only do we have no um, sense of being affected or, or ability to affect anything else, there are no others either. And he says, if I have no outside, if I have no outside, others have no inside. So that, that's, these are just some of the consequences of having this eternal cogito, this constituting consciousness. I've got a quote for you. The contact of my thought with itself, if perfect, encloses me within myself and prevents me from ever feeling transcended. There is no opening to nor aspiration for an other, for this myself who, con who constructs the totality of being and its own presence in the world, who is defined by self-possession and who only ever finds outside of himself what he has put there. This hermetically sealed self is no longer a finite self. The cogito ultimately leads me to coincide with God. The constituting consciousness is, in principle, singular and universal. And so that's what you're that's what, what we end up with Descartes' position. To avoid all of this, to avoid this um, and when I say to avoid all of this, I mean this doesn't sound like what we are. This doesn't ring true for human experience. So to, um, in order to not go down this path, we need to understand exactly how the world belongs to the subject and how the subject belongs to him or herself. And that's what we're going to spend the rest of this video looking at. So cue up the next section the subject and the world. Right, so um, so like I said, we are beginning with the subject and the world. And the way that Malo Ponte is going to start is by questioning this idea that is so fundamental to, was fundamental to Descartes. And it's, in general, it's, it's kind of taken to be the, the central idea that we are and I think we are this consciousness, this thinking, thinking being primarily, primordially. So he's going to question this idea and he does it through this seemingly reasonable and difficult to object to proposition. I can't be certain of the object I perceive, but I can be certain that I think I perceive it. So I'll just read that again one, one more time. I can't be certain of the object I perceive, but I can be certain that I think I perceive it. Seems reasonable, seems fair. But if you if you stop to think about it for a minute, and if you read the rest of, uh, of what Malo Pondi has to say in this chapter, you'll see that immediately what that does, what that proposition does, is it places us, it makes us a... A thinking being. It makes us, it reduces us to an intellectual, um, abstract, conceptualizing 
consciousness. So it, it emphasizes that to the exclusion of, of, of all other aspects of our existence. And Meloponte, as we've seen, does the opposite. That's, that's a kind of derivative mode of our being. So we, we're not this I think originally. And so through that, that proposition, Meloponte is going to question this, this idea, often just, just taken for granted that, yeah, we are a, a thinking thing. We're a thinking being primordially. Um, he's going to question that. And in the first part here, the subject in the world questioning or investigating how the world belongs to the subject, we're going to take the first half of that proposition. I can't be certain of the object I perceive. And so Meloponte is going to say, actually, that's not correct as it is. The two things here, the perceiving and the perceived, actually have the same existential modality. So let me give you a quote, and then we'll, we'll discuss this in a bit more detail. To see is to see something. To see red is to see an actually existing red. Vision can only be reduced to the simple presumption of seeing if we imagine it as the contemplation of a drifting and anchorless quail. So, to see is to see something. To see something red is to see an actually existing red. So these, these things can't be torn apart. That's what Meloponte is saying here. It's impossible to separate the perceiving and the perceived. And this is, this is kind of underlying everything that we've talked about up until this point. Meloponte is against this idea of, of having the subject over here and the object over here. And so this is typically being construed as a, as a constituting consciousness. So this, this isolated, independent, um, thinking thing that's kind of imposing its will. It, it's, it's creating value in the things that are out there, separate from it. And that's the, that's the typical way that we've... we've um, it, and it's, it's, a, it's a reasonable way of thinking about our relation with the world. Right? It seems that that's the way it is. We, we're in here, or I'm in here, and I'm different from all these things out there. Um, and I can take a position on them, I can think about them, I can move them around. So it's, it's quite natural to have this dichotomy, this dualism set up. But everything that we've talked about has, has questioned that, has, has called that... Um, or has, has seen, we've seen through everything that we've talked about, that, that that account just doesn't do justice to human experience, to human perception. So that, um, and that, that idea, that dualism is, is underlying this idea that we can't be certain of the object we perceive, but we can, we can be certain that we think we perceive it. So that, in, in order for that proposition to be true, we are, we are in a dualistic framework. And so already we can see that if that's the case, that proposition can't be true. Um, so yeah, <laughs> let me just backtrack a bit. I've, I've gone off on, a, on my own. I've, I've left my notes behind here. Um, so we're not the this, this separate constituting consciousness surveying a scene. So what have we seen then? Instead, if that's not the case, we've seen that we're fundamentally an engagement, a, a manner of existing, a way of taking up the world. We're not the separate thing from it. Um, so, to see is to see something, to see red is to see an, to see an actually existing red. But then you might say that there's a possible objection here. Does that mean that we're always right? We can never be wrong. If to see red is to see an actually existing red, how can I ever be mistaken? Well, we can. You can be mistaken. We are often mistaken. right? We think we see something and it, it turns out to, to be something different. The point here that Meloponte is making is not that 
our perceptions are infallible. The point is that it's impossible to separate the, per the perceiving and the perceived. It's possible to be mistaken, but the whole thing is mistaken. That whole unity, that whole single perception is mistaken. We can't separate it out and say, there's a subject here and an object there. The object was actually this, and the subject thought differently from what was out there. That, that way of thinking, placing the subject and the object on different sides of a ledger, is defunct. That way of thinking just doesn't work. With, and for all the reasons that we've talked about um, in, in the, well, 15 videos plus however many um, other videos I made during in the middle of chapters. Um, so that that's the idea here. It's not he's not saying that. Well, if you think you see red, then then there must be something red there. The idea is that there there is no separating those two. So consciousness then is entirely transcendence. And let me give you a quote. Vision is accomplished and fulfilled in the thing seen. Vision must surely grasp itself, for if it did not, it would not be a vision of anything at all. But it must grasp itself in a sort of ambiguity and a sort of obscurity, since it does not possess itself and rather escapes itself into the thing that is seen. Through the Kagito, what I discover and recognize is the profound movement of transcendence that is my very being the simultaneous contact with my being and with the being of the world. So vision there, to see something, to see is to see something. Vision is only accomplished and fulfilled in the thing seen. We can't separate it out. We can't say there's vision happening over here on the subject side and something seen over here on the object side. These things, that vision is both of those together. Um, and that, that's really what I want to stress here. Um, of course, he says vision, vision grasps itself. It's, it, it knows itself, or it wouldn't be vision at all. But it grasps itself in this ambiguity, in this obscurity, in this openness to being wrong, in this, in this uncertainty that, again, is something that's characterized just about every chapter and, and phenomenology of perception. There's uncertainty um, built into what it means to be a human being. And, and there has to be, because if there wasn't any uncertainty, um, there wouldn't be any perception either. So my uh, perception is necessarily incomplete, it's uncertain, it's ambiguous. And that that's what we saw in that original proposition that I read at the beginning here. I can't be certain of the object I perceive, but I can be certain that I think I perceive it. I can't be certain of the object. There is uncertainty there. But the point is that it's not for the reason that that proposition asserted. Well, it's not for the, um, the assumption that that proposition made, which was that there's uncertainty because I'm a separate subject. I'm a constituting consciousness over here, and the thing is over there. And the only thing that and vision is all wrapped up on this side. It's got nothing to do with that thing. So I can then be wrong, because there's this gulf between me and, and the object. That, that's the assumption underlying that, that proposition from the beginning. But that's, that's not why there is uncertainty. It's not why there's incompleteness. Rather, we have that because, not because I'm a separate consciousness, not because I'm separate from the object, but because I'm in the world, because I'm already out there. I am transcendence. There is no me and the world. There's just me and the world. So it's, again, there's, we're, we're breaking down that, that, um, dichotomy, that, that dualistic way of thinking. It just doesn't, it doesn't make sense to 
to have that that frame that framework in place and so anything that that any proposition any assertion that's built on that 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 that's derived from this dualistic way of thinking must be false even though it seems reasonable as this proposition does right i can't be certain of the object but i can be certain that i think i perceive it it's built into that very proposition that there's a separate subject and a, se a separate object and subject <clears throat> so immediately we can see that it just doesn't it doesn't make sense and, and when you when you analyze it though when you break it down oh wait a minute so to see is to see something then we're always right or that 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 argument that objection has already missed the fundamental idea here which is not that i'm infallible or my perceptions are infallible but it's that there's only one thing here there isn't there's just no way to say to say that <laughs> To say that the subject, I think I, I thought I saw something, but but what's out there is different, is already to have misunderstood what's going on. It's incoherent because there isn't this dualism. There's only this one thing. There's only this. Um, uh, I'm going to say it. It's Heidegger, but there's only this being in the world. I am in the world. I am transcendence. Um, and and the reason that it's there's incompleteness there, there's ambiguity, is because that that being in the world necessitates that there are boundaries, that I'm surrounded by these horizons, um, by which the world escapes me. And it must be that way. So yes, there is uncertainty, but no, not for the reason that that we um, we tend to think, i.e because I'm a separate thing over here. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. That, and that's, that's the subject's relation, relationship with the world, relation to the world. Now we need to look at the second part of that, the subject's relationship, relation to him or herself. So we'll start here with these, what Malay Pondi calls psychical facts. Um, and so now we're looking at this I we're looking at this I think in a bit more detail. Um, so we've done we've done the we've dealt with the relation we have with the world. Uh, let's turn to the I think itself. And like I said, we're going to look at psychical facts here, um, and then we're going we're also going to look at, at another part of of this relation relation we have with ourselves um, in the next video. But for now, we're just going to stick with the psychical facts. So what are, what are these? What are psychical facts? Well, just things like love, joy, desire, just, psych I guess, psychological states is, is a way to think about it. So these seem to be completely inner operations, purely inward, right? We, we're only dealing with ourselves. And so... I can love an object, so he takes love as an example. I can love an object even if it doesn't have the value that I invest it with. And the, I'll give you the quote. What is desiring if not the consciousness of an object as valuable? What is loving if not the consciousness of an object as lovable? And so the point of this <clears throat> is that it seems like here we've found a realm completely independent from anything else something that um, we're completely kind of locked in with ourselves we're not reliant on on anything else like we were before with our perception we could we could kind of relate to something outside us we don't have that here everything's happening within us so we've found it seems a sphere of absolute certainty where truth could not escape us. Everything in consciousness would be true. In other words, the self is completely transparent. Transparent to itself. <clears throat> we have complete self-possession. 
that's the idea so that's this i think this i think is 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 totally coincident with itself that's what i am i'm this uh, this thinking being i know what i am through and through because i'm the only thing relevant i'm the only thing there so it seems like that's true however even here malo ponti says we're capable of being mistaken we can be wrong here this isn't that a realm of absolute certitude <clears throat> which which we thought it was so before we look at at how malo ponti is going to explain that he he notes that first so we're talking about love and he notes that we have to distinguish between cases, real cases of false love and simple, simply errors in interpretation or bad faith. So the errors in interpretation and bad faith, in these cases, there was never even a semblance of love. So even though we thought, kind of, we kind of thought we were in love, but it was from the, from the very beginning, that love was absent. So th these aren't cases of, of true, genuine um, error. We're not truly mistaken here. And this is basically because Malaponti invokes self-deception for these cases, where we, and it, it's very interesting actually, he says in these cases we, we avoid asking ourselves the question whether we're in, really in love here. And because... The reason is we know the answer. We know that we're not. So we just kind of distract ourselves. We never come, we never face the, the, the question itself directly. Instead of kind, kind of lying to ourselves and saying, yes, I am, we just, we don't, we don't even ask ourselves the question. We focus on something else. We think about something else we like about that person. So there's this idea here that um, not all cases where where love is mistaken are actual cases of of, of truly being wrong. So he's he's kind of making it hard for himself. He's not taking that road. He's saying there are there are cases where um, we deceive ourselves essentially. And this is really uh, it's just a, a, a comment in passing in Milo Ponti here, but it's quite a deep insight that this capacity we have for self-deception and the way it's not you know we don't we're able to deceive ourselves in, in this really quite surprising way because we know we must know that you know if, if it's say in the case of love we know we're not in love really if, if we aren't if it's not real, I mean, we, we must know that. It's not like we're, we can't deceive ourselves as if we're a separate person from ourselves. So we must be aware of it, but we're able to deceive ourselves. It's kind of like that cognitive dissonance. We can, we can really, it's quite remarkable, the capacity we have for that. And the way that we, <coughs> sorry, the way that we do it, we don't just lie to ourselves. Obviously, that's not going to work because we know we're lying, but we we just look a little bit obliquely at the question, or we just avoid the question a little bit. We turn to the side, we distract ourselves. It's really quite quite interesting. But anyway, so he's making it difficult for himself. He's not he's not taking those simple cases where well, not simple, but those cases where it seems like we were mistaken. But he says. They, those, those cases, we weren't mistaken. They were errors in interpretation or bad faith, kind of self-deception. Nevertheless, he says there are real cases of false love. <clears throat> so what are these? First of all, he gives a definition of real love. And he says it's, this is being willingly united with the loved person. He or she really is, for a time, the mediator of my relations with the world. So that's kind of a nice definition of love. And in false love, what we find is that after the disillusionment of this love ends, so we, after we realize 
it wasn't real, we uncover some other reason for the love. So we didn't love them for the, for the love the person for who they were. Rather, we just we, there was this other reason why we um, we we thought we loved them. We 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 felt like we loved them, even though it was false. So maybe these were shared interests. Maybe we were just bored. We wanted some companionship, habit. There are, and there are many different things we could we could um, we could see as, as examples here. But after this, after the the disillusionment after we realize that it's not real love then we can see that we only love these certain qualities not as Malabondi says the singular manner of being that is this person him or herself so so that's quite cool there's this there's true love where you you, um, you know, that person mediates your relations with the world you love that singular manner of being that that person has and there's false love where you th where you genuinely thought that that was it was real love but it turns out and you later discover that actually there was some other reason behind it <clears throat> of course now so Malopondi is not saying here that that true love is forever or something that or that you know he's not subscribing to any anything simplistic like that like as if you know as if it's in the, the nature of human being to 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 have anything permanent about them so just in case you're thinking that that that's where he's going with this that, that that's what real love means it's forever real real love can end true love can end in only two ways though either when i change or when the, the other person changes and so true love can come to an end and it can still have been true love. It doesn't mean it must be permanent. It, if a love comes to an end, it doesn't mean it was false love. <clears throat> but false love um, is revealed as false when I return to myself. And I kind of broke that up so it didn't, it didn't come across quite as nicely as it should have. Let me read the quote properly. True love ends when I change or when the loved person has changed. A false love is revealed as false when I return to myself. <clears throat> so that's an example of the way that even though love, something that, that is, we would think is purely internal, something that we have complete, not control over, but, but complete, is completely transparent to ourselves we can't be deceived by this in order to love surely all that all that's required is that i find the person lovable <clears throat> but even here even in the, the heart of who we are Milo Ponte says there is this capacity for mistaken for error it's, there's this capacity to um, to be wrong and so we have this, even though we have psycho, these psychical facts, there is this lacuna in our self-knowledge. We, we don't see ourselves. We're not completely transparent to ourselves. And I like that expression. <clears throat> um, and he, he talks about why this might be the case as well. He says people's feelings are, are often hidden because we're dominated by situational values. So we're happy when we're given a gift just because um, that's, what, that's what one is. That's, what one's, that's the appropriate response. One is happy when you're given a gift. You're sad at a funeral. That's just, you're in a, that, that's the situation you're in. And um, so we're kind of, we, rather than authentically experiencing each situation, we just, we just kind of fall into, um, or we let the situation kind of determine our our feelings, our moods, our psychic states. And he says, we do indeed have the feeling itself, but only in an inauthentic way. The feeling is like a shadow 
of the authentic feeling. Our natural attitude is not to experience our own feelings or to adhere to our own pleasures, but rather to live according to the emotional categories of our milieu. So there's this idea there that there isn't really followed up. No, I point he doesn't follow this up, but there is this idea yeah, that there's this inauthenticity to our typical um, feelings, our typical moods. These feelings that we have, we live them for sure. It's not that we don't feel, it's not that we don't experience these feelings, but they're lived on the periphery of ourselves, he puts it, he says. Um, which is, again, a nice way to, to, to put it. It's, it's, it's almost like we're just going through the motions. We're not authentically engaging with each, each situation, with each um, context that we find ourselves in. <clears throat> so even there, even in these psychic states, certitude escapes us. Um, so we don't have our entire reality at each moment. But Malopondi wants to, to be clear here that this doesn't mean there is an unconsciousness operating. Both this and the idea that uh, we are a, a consciousness transparent to itself make the mistake that they, they think everything about me, everything about us, everything about me, <laughs> that's, I think that's better, everything about me, is already, lo is already located within me as an explicit object. It's just with, with the un idea of the unconscious, it's, it's still within me, but it's just something I don't know. Whereas with, if we're a conscious, pure consciousness, transparent to ourselves, it's, it's within me and I know it as if. Um, so in both cases, the idea and the, the, the error and the thought here is that what I am is, is totally contained within me as, as an object available for my, um, well, in the, first, in the second case, available if I'm a, a completely self-transparent or in the first case, not available to me or can be made available perhaps through years of psychotherapy um, <clears throat> as if as if what I am is something that I can come to know I can I can I can grasp intellectually as opposed to something that I live so that that's kind of the distinction here and again what we saw um, in the first part here or in the second part of this video the Consciousness is transcendence. I am already outside myself. I'm out there in the world. There is no, there, there isn't this distinction. And so in being out there, <clears throat> in being in the world, I'm, um, I'm not locked up within myself. I'm, I'm not, everything about me is not an explicit object which I can come to know. The quote the love that worked out its dialectic through me and that I have just discovered is not from the outset a hidden thing in my unconsciousness, nor is it for that matter an object in front of my consciousness. Rather, it is the movement by which I am turned towards someone, the conversion of my thoughts and of my behaviours. I was hardly unaware of it, since it was I who lived through the hours of boredom prior to a date, and I who experienced joy when it approached. This love was lived, not known, from beginning to end. That's it. And that, that is exactly what I was trying to say. Um, as always, the quote is ten times better than my explanation of it. Um, so yeah, we're talking here. Again, we can see this idea of, of Meloponte's feeling, uh, feelings as modes of being in the world not as these intellectual things that or these psychic states that, that have this kind of separate independent isolated life of their own same as we saw with sensation and perception the same as we've seen with everything in the low ponte um, so these are not explicitly known they're non-thetic 
is another way to say that, that the way that we're situated in the world. And he compares this as well to the sexual sense of the dream for the dreamer. And again, just refreshing things that we've talked about before. It's obviously, the dream is obviously sexual. Because the dreamer dreams their dream. So it's obviously sexual for the dreamer. But it's not explicit. It's not thematized. The dreamer isn't thinking, ah, yes, that, that symbolizes whatever, this, this, this or that. Um, this, this symbolizes sexuality for me. Now, you know, they're not, they're not analyzing it in that way. Rather, the, the sexual sense is the gen, general atmosphere of the dream. It's just, it, it's, what is, it's what the dreamer experiences rather than takes a, takes a deliberate position on and, and comes to know um, intellectually. Of course, we can do that. The point isn't, isn't that we, we're never able to, to analyze or, or to, to make of these things an object for us. Of course we can, but that's a second order reflective activity. That's not the way that we originally, fundamentally, primordially experience things. And that, that's, what we're, that's what we're looking at here, is, is the phenomenology of perception. We're not looking at what it looks like after we've we've already um, made the second order step, we've taken the step backwards. We're looking at what it means to actually experience things, to actually live firsthand, not as not as a third, um, not from the third person perspective. <clears throat> and I just thought about this, an example. It's kind of an obvious example or analogy, talking about the uh, the way that. The sexual sense is the general atmosphere of the dream, like a fish in water. The fish isn't conscious explicitly, thematically of the water. It's because it's just everywhere. It's, it's what the fish is, is moving in. It's what the fish is living in. So there, there isn't this um, separation. Again, though, the fish scientists will make that distinction. They'll say, ah, actually, this stuff that's all around us, it's... It's um, two two molecules of or two atoms of hydrogen and, and one of of oxygen, and um, and it has these properties and so on and so forth. But the fish philosophers will be saying, yes, yes, that's true, but that's not how we experience this water originally. That's not that's not our our first our fundamental relation with the water, and um, yeah, that's Malo Ponti. As, as recast in aquatic terms. So there's obviously Freudian. This is obviously a reference to Freud here, discussing the, um, the sexual sense of our dreams. And he talks, he gives the example, Milo-Ponti gives the example here that fire in the dream, it isn't a way of disguising a sexual impulse in an acceptable symbol, which is the way that someone like Freud would have analyzed it. It's, this is what it is for the waking person. That fire that was in the dream when, when we're thinking about it, lying on the couch in, in our psychotherapist's office, that it's a symbol for some kind of sexual impulse. But in the dream itself, it's not that, it's not a symbol for anything. It's, it's just, it embodies the sexual impulse. Because in the dream, images are employed in relation to their effective value, not as symbols, not as things that um, we substitute in because they're acceptable, as opposed to the actual, the actual thing, which the actual um, impulse, which which isn't acceptable, which we which is taboo. We have to we have to clean it up for ourselves. Um, the sexual signification is neither conscious nor unconscious in the dream because dream objects don't signify things. <clears throat> okay, and so it's the same then. So that, that was a little detour down, the, down into dreams. It's the same with love when we're awake. 
It's not an explicit object for us. It's rather the way that we establish relations with the world or with an individual person. It has an existential signification, not an intellectual one. It doesn't stand for something else. It's not something we take a position on. Of course, we can do that, but that's not our original mode of, of, um, of being in love. So the bottom line here, when, when, when we're situated, we can't be transparent to us, or we aren't transparent to ourselves. And our contact with ourselves can only be established in ambiguity. And that was that um, this that was the that idea where we're questioning this I think, this certitude that I am this um, this thinking being that is is completely that knows itself through and through, that's completely locked up within itself and therefore is completely transparent to itself. Turns out that's not it wasn't our relation that wasn't our relation with external things and it's not our relation with ourselves either so then now we have um, <clears throat> a return to doubt right we can we can make this ask this question again here do these this is this the capacity that we have here for inauthentic feelings does this mean then that everything about ourselves is in doubt can we can we now not be certain about anything that we, that we think we know about ourselves. Do we have to cast everything about ourselves into doubt? This fact that we're, no lo we, we're not self-transparent. Um, so talking about doubt here, Malo Ponte says that because our feelings are modes of being in the world, sincerity, the opposite of doubt, can only be accomplished by throwing oneself blindly into the doing. And we've talked about this before, I think. Um, my acts can only be certain. They can only reflect something certain about, about my feelings when I stop trying to think of them as certain, when I stop trying to analyze them and, and intellectually, thetically decide if they're certain or not. When we do that, we've already taken that step back and... Um, and then we're no longer acting with sincerity. That our feelings aren't genuine at that point because we're not in the first person anymore. We're not acting genuinely, authentically. We've we've stepped back. We're taking a um, a, a separated, a separate, separate, <laughs> distanced view of ourselves, which is already not genuine. Artificial, that's the word I was looking for. It's, we've already made that artificial step. So that there's no way that our feelings are genuine at that point. Rather, he talks about meeting up with myself in the act. Again, another really, really nice description and a really um, interesting, kind of, a, kind of a deep insight there, I think. We meet up with ourselves in our actions when we act. That's when we are our genuine selves that's when we we kind of not quite discover but almost that's when we discover ourselves when we when we know ourselves as we really are is is when we're acting not when we're thinking about how we act so there again that idea of action over thought i was thinking about this um kind of an example which is a little bit similar to this this idea that um we, we kind of doubt things prior to, or we doubt whether things are real, things are genuine, our feelings um, in this case, and, and the sincerity that can only be accomplished when we're actually doing it. it. Made me think about playing the piano, Not again, not that I can do this, but if, if I were to think about it without doing it, um, and just the way that pianist their, their, their right and their left hand work so independently of each other if I, if I were just to think about that and, and no one had ever done it before I would probably think that's impossible it's impossible to have that dexterity that the, the separation the independence 
of each hand. Um, it just seems impossible, you know. It, seem, it seems like if someone hadn't done it, I would have thought that, that, was, that was impossible. But when you do it, it's when you get in and do it, then um, that the, the doubt, the uncertainty fades away once you've actually accomplished it. But the uncertainty only fades away when you're doing it. It's only in the doing that the that you become um, that it becomes clear that, that it's possible. Prior to that, when you're just thinking about it, it's impossible. It seems impossible. It seems uncertain. And so this is just that same idea kind of raised the level. Uh, and there's also kind of a du double irony in this. The only way to really doubt isn't through the intellect then. Because if we doubt through the intellect, then we can, we can doubt that we're actually doubting. There's a never-ending regress there. We'll, we'll never um, find any, any firm ground on which to stand. So the only way we can really doubt that doubt can be a real genuine feeling for us is through a taking up of the world as doubtful, through engaging in the world as doubtful. And we've seen though that that's impossible. You can't you can't act as if you can't coherently, consistently act as if everything um, could be an illusion. So that, that that's that radical skepticism position, which we saw wasn't possible. But but yeah, there, there's this double irony there. I think um, we we wonder. Well, the, the only way that certainty is, is possible is through engaging in the world. And so that's the only way that we can be certain that we're doubting is by, by actively taking up the world as a doubtful thing. But then when we do that, it's no longer doubtful. We're certain. There's, there's a certainty behind it. Uh, okay, so what we have then, the final result here is that Basically, this, these are these psychical facts. The the self that I am, as I know myself through my through my psychic states, is a never completed synthesis. It's something I can't know for certain, and yet when I'm living it, it's as certain as anything else. <clears throat> it's it is certain. It can't not be certain. So we've got this 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 double um, this contradiction which we left the the last chapter with a never completed synthesis which is nevertheless self affirming um, and so this this applies to both the external world and the self as we've we've looked at it here uh, so in the first part the relation of the self to the world we saw that I am in the world consciousness is transcendent. So I can never verify my perception of the ashtray because perception, perception assumes more than I can know explicitly. There'll always be more to know. My perception will always overflow whatever I can, I can directly grasp intellectually. And regarding my, my knowledge of myself, um, I'm the one, I am the one living my feelings. So I can never verify my doubt because if I if I were to do that, I would have to doubt that 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 thought of doubt. So there's an, a, um, a never ending regress there, an infinite regress. Um, and certainty in both of those cases, then the case of the external world and the case of myself, only comes from total engagement, not by thinking about it but by living in both cases so he gives a, a nice a neat twist on Descartes I think I exist which was which is the way that he, he formulated that idea cogito cogito sum I guess without the therefore um, Descartes makes that statement in his meditations on first philosophy I think I exist um, and Ponty says, yeah, the two are definitely equivalent, but the I think doesn't contain the I exist, which is the way that Descartes formulated it. Rather, 
the I think is reintegrated into the I am, into the I exist, the I exist. So we have then consciousness reintegrated into existence. And that is a beautiful way to finish this, this, um, this part, this video. All right, summary, let's have a look. So first, uh, we, we had that question, or it wasn't a question, it was a proposition. I can't be certain of the object I perceive, but I can be certain that I think I perceive it. So we were questioning this idea of the I think, this idea that we are just an I think, a consciousness. Uh, so we looked at the subject and the world, the relation the subject has to the world, and we saw that it was certain, there was a certainty to it. Perceived and perceiving have the same modality. Consciousness turned out to be entirely transcendence, and that, which means I am in the world. But there was also an uncertainty and an ambiguity to this relation, not because the world is external to me, but because I am in the world again. Uh, and so we also looked at the re subject, the, rela the, the, the relation the subject has with him or herself as psychical facts. We looked at this through psychical facts. And again, we saw that there was uncertainty there. We can be wrong about these things. And we looked at false love. Uh, and we're typically dominated by situational values. So that we, we kind of have these inauthentic um, feelings which we nevertheless, nevertheless, we actually feel them, we actually experience them, but they just, there's no, um, it, it's, it's more like we're just kind of going through the motions. But there was certainty again in this, um, in this relation, in the sense that it was lived. So finally, we're left with the same situation, both, both cases, the subject and the world, and the subject and the self are never completed syntheses, which are nevertheless self-affirming. And that is the end of this first video. Like I said, there'll be three of these. Um, this first part of, on the Kogito. It's not really a good place to finish. There are no good places to finish in this. Everything really flows on. Um, so anyway, the next video will very much pick up exactly uh, at this point where we've left off here. Um, and we will just keep we'll just keep working through it. Uh, anyway, thanks for listening as always, and uh, I will catch you in the next video.